Hey, happy new year, everybody, and welcome back. Today, I want to talk about a rule that you've definitely heard of if you've taken any kind of intro calculus course, but if it's been a while since you took those courses, like it has for me, then you probably haven't thought about this in a really long time, and that is L'Hopital's rule. Now, my experience with L'Hopital's rule is that it's this seemingly magical rule that you can just throw at limit problems in calculus when they're not working out the way you want them to. Some kid in class yells hospitals rule, you use this rule on a couple tests to solve a couple problems, and then you proceed to never think about it again. But I do want to think about it again. And the reason is that I just found myself thinking about this is such a elegant magical rule, but at the same time, why should it be true? Why should it be true that if I'm trying to compute the limit as x approaches c of the quotient between two functions f and g, and I write into a problem case, for example, both the numerator and denominator go to zero, or both of them go to plus or minus infinity, where I don't really know what to do, why, why is it, in those cases, I'm able to just replace that limit and say that it's equal, it's equivalent to the limit as x approaches c, of the quotient of their derivatives, of f prime of x divided by g prime of x. It seems so neat and tidy, but at the same time, why is it so neat and tidy? Why is it able to be true? And I will say here, a little disclaimer about this video, there are a lot of assumptions that go into where this is true on the nature of the functions f and g. We're not going to be super, super, super mathematically rigorous in this video. Instead, we're going to kind of have this loose assumption that f and g are in some sense nice functions, uh, continuous differentiable, that sort of thing, things that you would see in the real world. And so for those of you who love mathematical rigor and want to yell at me in the comments section, please go for it, or more, more importantly, actually correct me so that uh, other folks have a better nuanced understanding of what's going on. But again, coming back to the point of the video, it's that if I'm trying to solve problems like this, here's one of them you may have seen back in calculus or currently in calculus, depending on where you're at in life. If we're trying to compute the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x, now if I send the numerator and the denominator both to zero, then I'm going to get a zero over zero case. That's no good. I don't know what to do with that. And so L'Hopital's rule says, hey, no problem, buddy. Go ahead and just take the derivative of the numerator. You get cosine of x, take the derivative of the denominator. You get one, send that thing to zero in the limit. And easily we see that's equal to one. And so now we're done with the whole problem. So we see that it was very, very useful in solving this problem. But why was it useful? Why is it actually uh, true that we're able to do this? And I want to start explaining that by looking at the more easy of these two cases, which is the zero over zero case. But that, that insight we gain from the zero over zero case is going to help translate over into the infinity over infinity case. So with the zero over zero case, let's stay on this exact problem for a second. Let's say we're trying to compute the limit as x approaches zero of sine x divided by x. Now I've reproduced both of those functions below. Sine of x is this sinusoidal wave that's in purple, and x is just this regular straight line that's in green. Now, if we kind of look at it from this zoomed out point, and we're trying to figure out what happens as we go into zero, that's exactly what limit problems are trying to do. They're saying, as you go into zero, as you go to the point x equals zero, what happens to the ratio between sine of x, this purple graph, and x, which is this green graph? Well, it's kind of hard to tell, so let's go ahead and zoom in. So this next picture here is zoomed in on the point x equals zero. As we zoom in, we see that both sine of x and x start being very well approximated by linear functions. X, of course, is already a linear function, so there's not really a sense in that statement. But more looking at sine of x, we see that as we zoom closer and closer and closer to zero, this curvature of sine of x really starts straightening out. And if we zoomed in even more and more and more, it would become impossible. It would become impossible to tell that sine of x is not just a straight line we would basically be saying that's just a straight line very locally to that point x equals zero. And that of course, folks, is the definition of a tangent line. We know that if we zoom in sufficiently far on any kind of function, on any kind of point, that function starts looking an awful lot like its tangent line, which is the line that basically has the same slope as that function at the point that we are concerned with. And because the point we are concerned with in the limit is exactly that x goes to zero case, or more generally that x goes to c case, what we are able to do in order to start helping us solve this zero over zero case is that we're going to replace f of x and g of x by their first order polynomial approximations, which is just a fancy way of saying exactly those tangent lines at the point x equals c. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing on this next page. So I'm gonna have both pages just so we can see what I did here. So we're saying that 
uh, we're trying to solve the limit as x approaches c of f divided by g. And I'm replacing f of x by this form, which is the formula for the tangent line of the function f at the point c. So you can see that's f of c plus f prime of c times x minus c. So that may look a little bit complicated, but you can fall back on even older math than calculus. This is basically just coming from algebra. This is saying if I have a point and the value at that point is f of c, and if the slope at that point is f prime of c, then go ahead and give me the formula for that line and we see that it's exactly this form. And for the same reason, we can do the same thing with g down here. So now we understand how we got to this formulation of the limit problem. And now things start to become really simple because we're able to do some crucial cancellations and simplifications. First, what is f of c and g of c? In other words, what is f evaluated at the limit point c and g evaluated at the limit point c? By definition, those are both zero because that's the whole reason we're going through this ordeal in the first place because we ran into a zero over zero case. And so we're saying that f of c and g of c are both zero and so they disappear from this formulation. So all we're left with is this on the numerator and this on the denominator. But of course, if we ignore that first term, we can simply cancel out the x minus c from both the numerator and denominator. And so really all we're left with folks is that it's f prime of c divided by g prime of c. And if we wanna convert that back into limit notation, then it's limit as x approaches c of f prime of x divided by g prime of x. So in this way, we've proven We've proven, and I've proven is a little bit in quotes here, because even this does have certain assumptions on the nature of f and g. But for most cases, we proved here that if you're trying to compute the limit of the ratio of two functions, then it's sufficient in the zero over zero case to consider the limit of the ratio of their derivatives. But more importantly, why did it work in this case? Well, it worked because we're able to do these cancellations. Why are we able to do these cancellations? Because in these terms that are both in the numerator and denominator, the derivative of the function in some sense took over relative to the value of that function. And the reason it was able to take over in this case is because the value of those functions, again, by definition here, were zero. And so whatever the derivative was in that case is going to be at least as big as zero. And so therefore it's able to dominate or take over the value of that function. So just remember this sentiment in the zero over zero case where we are able to do this very nice simplification because the magnitude of the derivatives of our functions takes over or dominates the values of the functions themselves. And so keeping that in mind as we go to the, what about the infinity over infinity case? So let's again start with an example here. Let's say we're trying to compute the limit as x approaches zero from the right. So that's, if you recall what this plus notation means is that it's a one-sided limit. We're just looking at what happens if you approach uh, x equals zero from the right of e to the one over x divided by one over x. And now to start getting a sense of what we think this limit might be, let's go ahead and graph these two functions, namely one over x in blue here, and e to the one over x in green here. Now just to do a sanity check, let's see what happens if we go ahead and just plug or put x equals zero into these functions. So as x approaches zero from the right, the denominator goes to one over zero, which is infinity and the numerator goes to e to the infinity, which is of course infinity. And so as promised, we are in that infinity over infinity case. But I don't know about you, but something feels a little telling looking at the forms of these two functions. And then again, looking at this graphical representation here. I don't know about you, but doesn't it feel, I'm putting quotes around feel here because it's one of those mathematical vibes. Doesn't it feel like e to the one over x should be much bigger? That's what I mean by this kind of double greater than sign. Is some order of magnitude bigger than one over x? Because one over x is here and we're using that in the uh, exponent of e to the one over x. So it feels like it's growing at this kind of more extreme rate than one over x because we're taking e to the power of that thing. So it sure feels like if that's the case, then this whole thing should go to infinity because there's some notion of e to the one over x just outpacing or outgrowing one over x. And these notions are very important because the, remember the words we just used there, outpacing, outgrowing, these are words that are very related to the rate of change of something. We're trying to kind of relate our thinking to the fact that the rate of change of e to the one over x is some order of magnitude greater. is just so fast that the rate of change of one over x just can't keep up. And therefore we feel like that whole story should make this limit infinity. But of course we need some way to concretely more express that mathematically. And to do that, we're not able to fall back on this exact same case we looked at here. 
because remember that involved taking the function's value at the point we're trying to do the limit at. And that worked fine in the zero over zero case, but in the infinity over infinity case, we can't very well just start plugging infinities into here. But we're going to take a similar trick of doing a functional approximation at a very local point. So consider the point x and the point x plus h on the x-axis. And so what we're going to do is a linear approximation to both functions at the point x plus h. So that's going to be this tangent line for 1 over x. And if I trace that up a little bit, it's going to be this tangent line for e to the 1 over x. And if using those linear approximations, we are trying to compute or estimate rather the value of f of x, then that linear approximation works out in the numerator to f of x plus h, which remember is the value here, minus h, which is the step we're taking to get from x plus h to x, which is the step we're taking to get from x plus h to x, it's a negative step here, times the derivative f prime of x plus h. So times the derivative f prime of x plus h. Again, if this seems a little bit confusing, it's falling back on the exact same algebra one slope point kind of mathematics. And so I would urge you to work that out for yourself. But what we're doing here is basically saying, if we want to estimate the value of f of x and g of x using these local linear approximations at x plus h, then the numerator is going to look like this, and the denominator is going to look the exact same way, just putting g's in place of the f's. Now I do have to be very clear here that this is a local linear approximation. And so I kind of drew these points rather far apart for illustration, because if I drew them really close, then it would be really hard to see what's going on. But in reality, we're talking about h being a very, very small number as being just a little bit of an offset from x. And if that's the case, then this local linear approximation uh, is more and more true. And so currently we're at this point and it looks like we made everything more complicated. But now we're going to start falling back on those notions of the derivatives of these two functions in the numerator and the denominator. So first let's compute those derivatives and then figure out how we can use that story to help simplify this form. So the derivative of the numerator e to the 1 over x is simply negative e to the 1 over x divided by x squared and the derivative of the denominator is going to be negative 1 over x squared. So I'm going to put brackets around them so it's clear which is which. So here's the numerator derivative and here's the denominator derivative. And now staring at these for a second and comparing them to the original functions, so concretely what we're doing here is that looking at the original function e to the 1 over x and looking at its derivative, which is e to the 1 over x divided by x squared, that's the magnitude of it, we can see that the derivatives are an order of magnitude greater than the original functions themselves because it has this x squared in the denominator here. Again, here we see that the derivative, whose magnitude is 1 over x squared, is an order of magnitude bigger than the original function itself, which is 1 over x because it has this extra x term in the denominator. And now we're gonna use that idea that the derivatives of these functions, both the numerator and the denominator, are in magnitude outpacing those functions themselves as we get closer and closer and closer to the limit point zero. We're gonna use that idea in order to simplify this form right here. And how we're gonna do that is basically say, hey, as we get to the limit, x approaches c, in this case, x approaches zero from the right, the magnitudes of these derivatives, f prime of x and g prime of x, are seriously outpacing the values of the functions themselves. So we see the values of those functions themselves written first, and then we see the magnitudes of those derivatives written second. And so what we're able to do basically, as we do in many limit problems, is say that when one term in a sum or difference is outpacing a different term, in the limit we can ignore the term that is being outpaced. It simply cannot keep up with the other term, in this case, its own derivative. Once we've canceled those out, we have this negative h and this negative h, very similar to these other terms we canceled out. We can go ahead and cancel that from the numerator and denominator. And so what we're left with is that that limit is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches c of f prime of x plus h divided by g prime of x plus h. And now, remember, we said that h needs to be a really small number. It's not as big as this picture would have you believe. It needs to be small, actually, for this linear approximation to be uh, true in any sort of way. And so we're going to go ahead and send that h to 0. And what that gives us is that we're actually saying that the limit in the infinity over infinity case as x approaches c of the quotient of the functions, of the ratio of the functions, is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches c of the quotient of the derivatives of those two functions. And we have quote unquote in a very fuzzy but somewhat mathematically rigorous way, shown and proved that even in this case, 
we're able to have this formulation of L'Hopital's rule. And why does it work in this case? Well, for the same fundamental reason that it worked in the previous case, just with minor differences. In this case too, we saw that the value of the function, the value of the function becomes meaningless, becomes insignificant compared to the magnitude of its derivative. And we showed that here by showing the derivatives just take on a whole new kind of magnitude, a whole new kind of growth rate relative to the functions they originally came from. And it's exactly that takeover of the function's derivative over the function itself, the same thing we had in this case, that's able to let us have the formulation of L'Hopital's rule. So folks, hopefully you thought that video was kind of interesting. And so if you're still here and stuck around all this time and still feel like your itch is unsatisfied, I think the best I can offer you here is just a tie-in of this to a life lesson, which is, hey, doesn't matter so much where you are, all that matters is the rate at which you are growing. And that applies to math and whatever else you are trying to do in this new year. So folks, again, Happy New Year. I hope to see you in many more videos this year. Please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Any comments are welcome in the section below, especially for those mathematically rigorous folks who want to point out all the flaws and assumptions that I made here. And I'll see you folks next time.